everybody for showing up. I know I'm not getting lunch, so hopefully you've already eaten. Otherwise, lots of rumbly dummies. Um, yeah, I guess we've got the dual screeny thingy here, so I'll probably try and stand here and then maybe laze Pedro appropriate time. Um, it's a bit of a history story, but what I found, history often has things that still vex us as we go forward. Lessons that we didn't learn, things we didn't pay attention to. And often in the moment, when you're doing things, you don't really have perspective. It's only after you've had a chance to, like a red wine, mull for a while, you do actually think about, what did we actually do? What did we do right? What did we do not so right? And is there something that can be applied now? And I think definitely, given the, my major background is in geophysics, as, as my rap sheet describes, but really, geophysics Geophys was fun, but the geophysics part was the geo part was really the, the part that drove my curiosity when I went into the business, and it still does, about how do you link geology and physics together in a meaningful way? And one of the things, of course, in exploration are the tools. And if the tools aren't available within the service industry, the concept is you need to, if you have the resources, to go build those tools. Like you see, you know, if you've got a, a spear that's big enough to bring down an antelope and then a mastodon appears on your horizon, you probably have to upgrade. And that's what, in the time frame that I'm looking at here with BHP, we were doing. It wasn't that anything didn't exactly exist, but we wanted to make things better because we thought in the course of our exploration programs that would give us a competitive advantage. One of the, the slippery slope on that, of course, is that geophysics is famous for is the silver bullet problem. You're always trying to come up with something that cuts off thinking, cuts off discussion, produces such a large, big red anomaly with whatever you do, and geochemistry sometimes falls in the same boat, is that, that when you're explaining things to non-specialists, getting money, getting support, they tend to side on the issue of, well, this will cut out a lot of the chatter and we'll actually have a definitive answer like after the first day. This is not nuclear bomb technology, most of this. That was about the only one that I ever know actually did exactly what it was designed to do from the very first time. It was just awesome. We did really awesome stuff and one of the interesting issues that I still think about is that everything we went out to do actually worked but it didn't deliver what we wanted to us. So where was the failure? Where was the, where was the implementation issues, which still, I think going forward now, we still have problems of how do we effectively use technology? How do we integrate the results from geophysical surveys, from geological knowledge, from geochemical data sets, from remote sensing? Where are the people that actually bring this stuff together? And the talk last night, which could have been here, but deja vu if some of you listened to it on the Geosoft site, it's a silo issue. A lot of this ends up being knowledge stuck within very specific places. BHP had the advantage that we effectively had, well, I think at the time, 1994 was the pivotal year when they bought the company I currently, I work for at that point, which was Utah International. But what some people don't know, and maybe it doesn't matter, we had been owned by General Electric for four years, four years, eight years. They bought us in 76 when inflation was very high, and we had a lot of coal assets, and they said, that's a way to cover your ass financially, is to have a lot of natural resources that will go up in value with inflation. But what it gave me a chance to do, because I was living in Toronto at the time, was go down to the GE Schenectady lab. This is where Edison did his stuff, and Helmholtz, and who was the other one? I don't think Tesla worked for them. But... Uh, I got to see the machine that made the original diamonds, artificial diamonds. It was about a three-story high, looked like a big pressure cooker. And there was this glass portal, 10-inch thick glass with this big crack through it. And they put a big vise, squeeze it together, fire up the nuclear reactor, which was just down the road that they had also built, and they run it and basically produce diamonds. Well, the jig slipped, and it hit the glass, and it cracked it.
One of the stories they, I liked was when they said, people say we only make micro diamonds. He says, that's, that's hogwash. He says, we have the nuclear reactor. When an executive retires, he gets a two carat tie clasp and some cufflinks, and the good lady gets ear pendants, all multi carat diamonds. It's not a question of can I do it, it's do I want to do it. And there, there, uh, there I learned, didn't practice, but there I learned, I guess, one of the greatest research groups that I ever saw commercially. BHP, they had a group of over 700 people in about five institutions around Australia just doing research for the company when they bought Utah. Incredible resource. That, that is all gone now. That's, you know, that's one of the past things. And they're certainly an important part of the story. So, in a way, it starts when Utah and BHP came together. I mean, in the Utah group, we had some ideas, but we played at relatively a, a low level, a low threshold. And BHP, up to that point, even though they were the largest Australian company, uh, uh, the big awker is they were known. Pedro, at some point, I need to change. Yep. Uh, there we go. With the arrows. The the arrows. The keyboard. Here. Oh. Okay. That guy. Okay. Cool. Excellent. So, you're only going to see his ugly mug once. Well, it's actually twice. But the research program that I'm going to be describing, by and large, was driven by this man's ego. He became the managing director of BHP in 1991. And the company was doing pretty well. We, uh, Escondida had just come online. A caddy had just been found. Cannington was just being developed. All major world-class resources. Oil company was doing pretty well. We had a div division. They still do. Some people wanted to sell it. But Prescott was a mean son of a bitch. And he basically, <laughs> he basically told his executives he wanted to see 15% real growth per annum in the businesses. 15%. And of course, they panicked. Some of the guys even said, we can't do it. They were asked to leave. <coughs> I've, I've heard this. He actually, he would call them out in a meeting, and basically they would be dismissed from the group. Um, so some of the groups would have a, an opportunity to expand existing operations. This is very, you know, standard thing. <clears throat> How do we get more tons through the mill? Buy more trucks, buy more shovels, put more stopes in. So we, we can actually try and get some increase in, in product productivity that way, put another rail line in. Other groups, it's acquisitions. And that started to become where BHP came off the rails, literally. The Magma Copper, uh, $2.5 billion acquisition, 1996. Uh, value, I think, when they... If you looked at it afterwards, it was maybe around two to three hundred million. But they had interesting. They had a toll going, which we gave away to Friedland. Or BHP did. And other parts of the group <coughs> said, "Okay, we're actually going to have to come up with some new technologies to find things that are in our existing business portfolio, <coughs> but currently are out of reach." And so this is where the strategic thinking of why you would put money into research in a more, much more formalistic way. Because the existing BHP research group was largely ad hoc. The steel guys would come in and say, we've got a problem with this blast furnace. It's overheating. Or the guys running the railroads would say, we're breaking too many wheel chassis. We need to fix that. And they would solve those problems. So they were kind of the go-to guys for tactical stuff. There wasn't really a vision of, of where we're going to be in five years. What are we going <coughs> to deliver to the company that's going to be a game changer in, in, a, in, a, in a longer period of time. <clears throat> and one of the things BHP did, and I assume other Australian companies, they like to role model themselves around uh, big American companies. Uh, interesting, on the safety front, it was DuPont. But on the research side, it was General Electric Group, as I said, I had some experience with. So they set up a tiered research program Call it the tactical, which was everything from sort of a month to, to six months, less than a year out. Uh, medium term, which was sort of three to five year. And then strategic, high risk, high reward, out like five years. <coughs> Within six months of starting that program in 1994, the strategic was gone. 
And what we had left was the support for tactical projects, of which the last one I'm talking about, Falcon, fell on that. Within research, it's within the exploration research group itself, which really wasn't a formal group, but the chief geophysicist and I was one, and there was a guy in Australia, <coughs> we had the opportunity to do some projects kind of on our own that then several of them grew into much larger co corporate funded ones because of the, the formal formalizing of a, of, a, of a BHP research activity. But in the end, um, this push, uh, one of the things that one of the groups did, and it, it's strange how this works sometimes, but a very, a very well liked, well regarded executive in what was called the, the BHP Iron Ore Group built what was called a hot briquetted iron facility up at Port Hedland. It looked like Cape Canaveral. It was the size of one of the launch boxes for the Saturn rocket. And it was right beside the ocean, right beside where they loaded the iron ore that came out of the Pilbara. And the idea was it was going to give them an advantage for very fine grained iron ore. It actually never worked. There was another $2 billion. So when you took magma, the HBI, and a couple of other stuff ups, all of Prescott's push in the 90s resulted in 98, he and his chairman were turfed, and the company transformed itself entirely to a, a risk-adverse, don't do anything, it's going to cause waves, get rid of the research guys, and we went from an exploration, a group of 750 and 42 offices around the world, to about 15, very, very quickly. But, what do we do right? There's part of the group, that was the management group, um, at one of our very difficult retreats in northwestern France in 1993. Uh, so this would be, you know, we probably had the largest exploration group in the world. So it was a very exceptional group in terms of size, in terms of budget, and in terms of vision. And so the research programs that I'll be discussing sort of rode along with this <coughs> with this group, and they were, I won't say the guinea pigs, but they were certainly the people we intended the technologies be used by. The first program was probably the, the most modest in terms of hardware, in the sense that we really didn't invent a better way to acquire magnetic data. I think we saw that the existing systems contractors were quite able to generate the data. What we lacked was access. So they started off being an Australian company. In, in my part of it in Utah, magnetics data was there, but what do you do with it at a project level? You file it for assessment. Very little interpretive work was ever done with that information. But in Australia, because of the regolithic cover, they had become very religious about using magnetics to, as a de facto way of obtaining geological information. And they pushed, you know, it was an interesting time for them because the Utah group in Australia in 1984 and through the late 80s had to figure out a way to merge with, uh, with the original BHP group. And, of course, there was a lot of competition between the two and, you know, who's the better, who should be running it. Uh, and in the end, it was all called BHP, but there was a strong element of... of um, call it the bravado, I think, of the Utah group, a little more the, the cowboy approach. But anyways, they focused, focused in on acquiring uh, VAX uh, computers, data general, VAX computers, to do image processing, to start to do very fundamental things that parts of the service industry had done historically, so they left the acquisition to the contractors, but they took all of the, the post- once the propeller stop work was being done internally. And they developed a package they called Processing Imaging Technology, also nicknamed by Phil Harmon, who ran the shop at the time, Pie in the Sky. And they had this, this software, and they said when they, when they finally merged the two, the Utah and the BHP groups formalistically in 91, uh, they said, we're going to do everywhere else that we did in Australia. So I had, a, I had a lady working for me in San Francisco at the time, geophysicist, and she called up 
here, or send a letter. No email that time. She says, we're interested in your OMAG data. And they said, well, we'll send you an index and this. And she says, no, I'm interested in your OMAG data. I said, what do you mean? She says, we're buying your AeroMag data. And I, to my knowledge, they're probably one of the few groups that spent the $140,000 at that moment and just got all the data. And we just did this around the world. We were involved with the Leeds African Magnetics Project, early contributors to that, programs in Russia, <coughs> South America. We basically vacuumed up the world. Why? Largely driven by the discovery of this deposit, Cannington, major lead zinc silver deposit, was the largest silver producer for a number of years in northern Queensland. Very strong magnetic anomaly, but there were a lot of other strong magnetic anomalies, and it was through basically some good geo sleuthing, as well as having good quality data, that allowed them to see through about 40 meters of black. It's a, um, I think it's a tertiary marine sediment. Very conductive and very uninformative from a geological perspective. So you got Mount Isa that sits up about 300 kilometers to the northwest. So when Cannington was found, the mag was very important for the Utah group, uh, or the North American group, with the diamonds exploration around Ducati. Mag was certainly one of the, the golden child. And so Looking at the fairly distinct signature, people said, okay, this one was easy. The next one is probably going to be hard. We're going to have to do more interpretive work. And so they went out, and with all these new data sets they had, they compiled an atlas of geophysical magnetic signatures, radiometrics that they had, it, but always magnetics, basically every major deposit type in the world. 500-page volume first put together in the early 1990s. The last cut was 1999. Probably nobody else has something like this still. BHP put it together over 20 years ago. But having a book isn't the only thing. So what they did, there's the, there's the compilation. We had a North American stitch, I think it was five years before the Canadian US stitch came out. We had all the data, we put it together, and I've still got that grayscale map on my wall my office in Denver. Do we do much with it? Well, I'm here working for, working for myself and the other people involved, not too much. But it was a very massive exercise that we basically vacuumed up everything that was around. And we added where we could. I mean, you know, we didn't have unlimited resources or time. But in terms of working with the data, there's a copy of the front, uh, the last edition, December 1998, put, to, put together by uh, Noel White. He's an economic geologist and uh, still lives in Brisbane. And, uh, but key thing that went with that was the course that basically allowed the students to sit down, groups of 20, 25, they'd spend a week, and they would go through basic principles of aromag interpretation. And I don't really know of any other course quite like that at the time. Like Dave Isles now has an e-book, him and Lee Rankin put together. Some other individuals, like SRK has a component in their stuff on structural mapping with aromag. But BHP's program was probably, we probably put it through three to four hundred people in a span of about four years. We're trying to... Uh, and a lot of the ideas came out of Professor Boyd, the University of Adelaide, who had worked for hunting and was an expert aeromag interpreter. And uh, a number of his students, like Dave Isles, um, Tom Whiting, all were working for BHP at the time. So we had the world's best people. The idea was, wait, when we go into these new terrains, we're going to be able to zoom in very, very quickly. Unfortunately, the outcomes... Um, really, as, as a, on a, on a mag-only basis, there were no other attributable deposits found through the effort. Um, you always saw the mag, you know, when we went into Tanzania or, you know, other parts of Southern Africa, uh, around Oyotolgoi, we inherited that from the magma people. You'd always see mag data, and it would be talked about, 
but it was very difficult to actually tra translate into a strategic resource in the, in the way that we had envisaged. And I think it was a question of time. The company just expected, you bought the data, next year you're going to be drilling, the year after that you're going to have a deposit. And we just couldn't quite work to that schedule. At that scale, it was, we just really, even with the number of people we had, we took, we took on too large of a, a bite. So hundreds of people went through the training. Hopefully they're still contributing to the industry, and maybe at some point BHP, something might come back indirectly through that, if their company, that these former employees, uh, the skills they have. Uh, but we produced a, a very nice package, which does Fitzgerald, commercialized as Intrepid. And that is still, you know, a reasonable commercial package for processing aeromag data. Now, ADES has added tons more in the last 20 years, but the original jumpstart for DES came out of the BHP software. We basically, when I arrived in Australia in 93 for a two and a half year stint, helped manage that process. So Phil Harmon's pie in the sky, that off became intrepid. That also happened in the EM side of things. The airborne EM story, the MAG thing didn't really have any serious corporate involvement, although some of the research people in the 90s did help with some processing of potential fields and magnetics data. It was really the EM project started to co-mingle with the BHP research people in a serious way. The first project, though, got started was we called the, uh, we just ended up, because base frequencies in Australia are 25 hertz, the Aussies called it the 25 hertz project. And it was set up between Aberfoyle, BHP, and Geoterics. And the concept was to bring the 150 hertz geotem system down to a base level, which had a chance to get through the conductive cover in Australia. That was the point. It had got started in 1992. Um, first uh, intermediate step was a 75 hertz system, which we grabbed a hold of, used it in Arizona. We used it in uh, Tanzania over Kabanga. Still not a low enough frequency, but one of the other things they contributed was upping the power, too, which, uh, you know, in those days, 250000 for a fixed-wing system was pretty standard. Now, it's multi-millions. The CSIRO, major Australian research group, government-funded, <coughs> thought they should do more with BHP, or thought BHP should do more with them. And they uh, tickled Prescott's fancy to do a joint venture. And CSIRO had a, Kathy Foley in her group, had an had a embryonic program in high temperature squid technology. What they were lacking was really applications. They were developing the sensors, but they weren't quite sure what you're going to do with it. So one of the things in discussions that I wasn't involved with, but I ended up taking over the project, was could we build a better airborne EM sensor? Not a system, but a sensor. So the program started. Um, a gentleman, Mike Aston, who's now at Monash, he was one of my co uh, colleagues in, in, uh, in BHP in, in Hawthorne. He supervised the initial work on the ground system. And we took it up to Cannington. They got an actual prototype going fairly quickly in like 1993, ran over Cannington, got a pretty good result. But the ground system wasn't what we were after. We wanted to put it in an airplane. And negotiating with geoterics was, was interesting because you were, BHP at the best of times was, was, uh, could be real buttheads and intimidating, I think, and, and lots of lawyers. But we managed to get a deal with them, and we got access to what they call the Big Bird, which was their EM housing, the fiberglass housing that their coil sat in, and we got to put our thing inside. Now, at that point, the BHP research people just did amazing things. I mean, they were some of the smartest engineers that I had ever come across, and they, were, they designed a buckyball to basically put the high temperature squid system in. You know, nowadays, 3D printing is, is pretty common, but back then, they were one of the first to actually produce this ball that sat inside the big bird that held the high temperature squid sensor, all to keep it balanced. And they had a, 
they had 12 different types of parachute cord that they found each different type of cord had different characteristics to temperature, humidity, and heat. And they basically did the research to come up with, it's like racing tires for Formula One cars. I don't think geoterrorists had ever in their life thought that that was possible. But we had people at the Newcastle lab that basically had done this to produce this product so that that coil, the whole thing is to keep it stable when it's flying through the air inside Big Bird. So we ended up uh, complementing that with the beginnings of uh, layered earth modeling of EM data, uh, forward and inverse modeling. Uh, we had stuff out before, at that time, Macquarie and the Myra group were producing uh, uh, EM flow, which became industry standard for a CDI type presentation for EM data. We had basically better stuff several years earlier. And we had geotem systems, which when they started flying the 25 hertz, were very, very heavily used. I think geoterics at the time had three airplanes, and my understanding is that we used two of them exclusively for about three years. Something in that order. So every line kilometer flown, we had two-thirds of one of the, of the major company's capacity, which actually really ticked off our partner at Abbotfoil, because they had equal rights to it, but they could never get the airplane, because BHP was busy flying everywhere. And fly we did. But the squid sensor, it worked. Um, that's some of the timelines. Say we jumped on the 75, but it, uh, it really wasn't enough. And even the 25 hertz wasn't enough either, unfortunately. You really needed, in the, the sort of terrain around Cannington at least, you had to probably go down, you know, half that, which is just now happening, by the way. It's, it's not, you know, this is almost 30 years later. People have not solved that problem. It's not a trivial one to go drop your frequencies down to, say, under 10 hertz for a, a dynamic platform. Major increases in dipole moment, and that always, it's a given people will do that with an airborne EM system, but it, it's, it seldom seems to be critical. The frequency seems to be more important, low frequency. CSIRO was, uh, on the technical side, were good people to work with. Their legal people were, were uh, somewhat vexing at times. <coughs> I had to deal with them. We did three trials of the squid system. The last one was in November of 97, up at Timmins, and it worked. Our problem was Falcon. We had also put a big engine in the water with gravity gradiometry. And even the company the size of BHP, we couldn't cope with two systems of, of the complexity that we knew that, say, this airborne squid sensor was going to provide. Because my back of thumb calculation, or envelope calculation, was we're probably the only ones that are going to use the squid, at least for the first three to five years, and we're going to have to pay the entire premium that geoterics would have to charge. It's like having a nuclear-powered car. It sounds great, but where do you put it when you're not driving it, right? It's just geoterics has to take care of it. And you know, when you ran the numbers, our group was not going to pay that premium and then, what we did motivate geoterics to do, though, they came up with a derived B field. In part, we think, because they were scared that we were going to start commercializing a sensor in competition to their system. I keep pointing to Paul, but I'm not trying to put him on this. But anyways, brings back. So, in a way, the SQUID program got kneecapped by geoterics' own innovation to do a B-field system. But they weren't the first. There was an Indian gentleman put one together 15 years earlier. He built it, flew it once, and stopped. God bless. You know, it just, you don't know. Obviously not very commercially orientated. So the squid system at that point, for us, stopped, which really ticked off the lawyers at CSIRO. Anyways, um, processing and modeling that was a fun part because it, it really does live on. It's hard to actually say what deposits it's found, but it certainly made quantitative assessment of data 
easier. You can do these sorts of processing exercises now fairly quickly. And one of the, well, I say, it's not to disparage 3D inversion, but at least 1D inversion, you, you've only got two squirrels in the paper bag as opposed to five. I mean, a 3D model, you're trying to think of what are all the things going that could be around screwing me around and what's really happening at 500 meters. Well, most of the 1D stuff, you're pretty safe. You're, you're, you, you know, edge effects and things like that, most people can kind of accommodate those things. I know the uh, Riva's done a, a 2D inversion, which they don't really release much results. And the problem with often with the, our airborne stuff, the, the 3D inversions is the lines are too far apart. You don't really have enough information or you don't have the right components. So 1D still for us is really bread and butter. GEMEX was basically our way of handling all this data because we are all these airborne systems flying. So BHP Research was commissioned to put a package together which didn't exist to handle all of this line sectional data and everything like that. That then got outsourced 99 to uh, ENCOM and that became a core part of Profile Analyst. So two of the major software applications we developed, one for magnetics and one for EM. They actually were outsourced. We didn't get any money other than some benefits on software down the road, but that's okay. This was kind of the problem uh, that we were facing at Cannington. This is a ground TEM survey. So in the Cannington, as most lead zinc systems, isn't, isn't a stunning conductor, but there are parts of it that are conductive and you'd like to see them if you could. But this is sort of the black soil response up in here. I apologize, the scale bar with time has, has slipped away. But there's the Cannington deposit there. So what we wanted was an airborne system that could see that. Didn't quite get there. We had to be happy with the mag. is pretty diagnostic where Cannington is. And we seemed to see, we saw a piece. Now, is a piece enough to make a discovery? We never really went through that exercise. Um, but that's as good as our 25 hertz gave us over the original test target. So the 25 hertz became the industry standard, the industry standard, and it still is today. So we set that with that program with Aberfoyle back in the early 90s. So we got, you know, the industry benefited. The squid technology was never deployed commercially in the airborne. There is a squid, a low temperature squid, I understand, that Spectrum, who have now been separated from Anglo, fly for a multi-component magnetometer system. I see it in the trends, Pat Killeen's trends thing. And I think it's still functioning. What was interesting was the ground system had life. And that ended up being commercialized by Crone and by their actually their Australian partner called Outer Rim. And that was taken up to Raglan in the early 2000s. <coughs> That's one of Kathy Foley's, Keith Leslie. This is a uh, um, trial up at Raglan. I mean, this is an Australian. Most of the time, he's in shorts and a t-shirt at 85 degrees Fahrenheit, right? So going up to Raglan was some different story uh, for him. But the first tests, 2001, were very successful. They published on it in 2002. And then later on, with time, five years program through the Raglan belt. These are the deposits that are attributed to the squid technology. Something like six billion dollars in gross value were found with the ground squid technology that BHP had developed. But not one cent, of course, went back to BHP. So the technology was successful. The airborne system might at some point, it was technically successful, we just didn't find a commercial home for it. And the power, everybody loves power. Ah, and that, of course, that, that's, well, logarithmic is almost suitable for this stuff now because we, we've shot way past the half million. One of the side outgrowths, because it made us pretty cocky and interested in airborne EM, we had um, noted that the porphyry deposits, a number of the porphyry deposits in Chile preserved chalcosite blankets. They were conductive. We could see them with EM, with ground EM, and we were pretty sure we could see them with airborne EM. So we went to Geoteryx. They had flown for us in 1994, a big program around Chile, or Escondida, sorry. Uh, but when we went back two and a half years later, 
They said, no, aviation safety, we can't fly a twin engine airplane at those altitudes. And it wasn't just the altitude, it was also the fact that where were they flying to get to the coast, there was a ridge, and if one engine went out, they couldn't go over the ridge and get down to the ocean or Anafagasta. So, they rented, stole, whatever, this uh, airliner, Dash 7, and put their existing geotem technology, which we had invested all this money in over the previous five years to get it down to 25 hertz. And we had two things we wanted. We said we want a million dipole and we want 12 and a half hertz. And Geoteryx, God bless them, delivered on both of those. Because we knew in Chile there weren't a lot of power lines and we weren't going to have a big issue there. So this is, <laughs> this is, bef this is pre livery colors, right? <laughs> I don't, who, the previous owner, I guess, got the rights on the nose, but this is how, this is how the beast out, out, uh, was all done just outside of the airport, uh, uh, outside of Pearson. There's a kind of an engineering hangar, and uh, I came up a number of times just to take pictures. And I remember the pilots loved it, right, because it was the first survey they had ever, aircraft had ever flown and had a toilet in the back. <laughs> no more little bottles. So... Uh, we flew it extensively in uh, Chile, in Peru. Uh, it became ultimately, and I had a cartoon I showed at a BHP internal meeting, where we stuck the Falcon in the back too, which then, years later, became the Griffin system. Not technically good, just not commercially successful. There was the sort of programs that we conducted, massive flying campaigns, and the way we de-risked it for Geoteryx was, it was pretty simple. We said, if you put it together, We'll fly so many kilometers at such and such a rate for three years. And, and their, their owners were happy with that. I have asked colleagues with major mining companies, pose the same question to them in the last 10 years, and they, they flee the room. It's like, oh, we can't do that. We can't extend ourselves out like that. We don't know if we'll exist in five, three years or two years. So we could do things back then that were commercially and technically made sense and achieved some pretty, pretty awesome outcomes. Ah, das Boot. So the last one, and this was, this was really 100% corporate. Exploration, minerals exploration came up with, the, with the, uh, the strategic idea as to why we wanted an airborne gravity system. But it, it had to fall because of the costs and the complexity and you, it wasn't just you could go to the guys that made the system and say, give me one of these. You had to actually say, we want to run it in an airplane, and it's not a C-130, because they had one that ran in a C-130. We need it in a small plane we can afford to fly, single or twin engine. So we needed scientists that were as good or better than the people manufacturing and engineers who were actually manufacturing the instrument. And we needed a really good subcontractor for flying, and there's a representative here with that group, Stefan Sander. They did a wonderful job. But anyways, the Navy built it for about a half billion dollars. Uh, it was something to do with the Cold War. They had done gravity surveys in the Atlantic, so they knew all the missile trajectories, regardless of where the submarine was, the boomer was in the Atlantic. They knew the gravity field well enough to launch the missiles to Moscow or Kiev. But then, the Chinese came on the scene. Rascals, just like the Koreans. They didn't have time to map the gravity field of the Pacific. So they said, let's take the gravity solution with us. We'll take a gradiometer on board. And that was the, I understand, the strategic reason why the gravity gradiometer system was created for the US Navy. Then when the Berlin Wall came down, what do you do with the gradiometers? Well, there was an enterprising American, Brett, who uh, one of the systems that the Navy had was on a boat, a big boat, and they did some trial surveys in the Gulf to see if it could be used for oil exploration, subsalt. One of the vexing things for seismic correction is you get the high velocity salt layer and you can't see the sweet stuff underneath. But if you can map the salt more effectively, you can back it out of the reflection equations, is my understanding, and get a better idea where you could target to drill the, the pay zones underneath the salt. So he was 
call it snooping around with some venture capital money. We, of course, had only honest intent, right? We were, we, we were there for the, the greater good of BHP, not to make money. And um, so we had this very interesting competition for a while in 91, 92. And, but when you get into stuff like this, you just don't take it on board that it's going to work. And one of the things our, our engineers were able to come up with they call it a six DOF, six degree of freedom, shaker. So I'm not sure if, I think World Youth Science actually provided it, but we had spec aircraft turbulence spectrum from, a, I think, a twin otter. And, but I don't think Sander provided this because this was a couple of years before we had our deal with, with Stefan's group. So we designed that and built that at the, at the Bell facility in Buffalo, New York. The gravity sensor was inside, and we flew an aircraft spectra, drove the pistons, so we could see how the system behaved. From that work, this was the original three-component gradiometer, which the Navy had designed. So one, two, three, all sit like that. That was too complex for us. We wanted, with that design, where that information allowed us to figure out we can do it all with one, and we just put more accelerators around we had eight rather than, I think, four in the original one. But then there were three of these. And the Navy always wanted redundancy. We just said, screw it. We don't need two out of three. We, we just need one working. And if one's not working, you know, we're not, we're not blowing people up with nuclear missiles. It doesn't matter if we have that sort of failure. We can deal with it. This was their, this was their ground, their SWAT team one <laughs> that they drove around this giant GM motorhome. And, uh, but part of the electronics were necessary to... Uh, to run the experience. So we did this in 91, so we had an argument. We had a strategic argument and a technical argument. We could actually see this thing built. So we took it back to the company. And at that time, the minerals division, which I worked for, there's a guy called Jerry Ellis, there's a mining engineer called Bob Hickman, and there's my boss, Oliver Ware, and the exploration. All three of those people said, no. 1993, we presented it all to them. They said, no, we don't want to do it. Well, they didn't all say no in the same room at the same time. but the the guy I work for, his line was, after we made the presentation, he says, he says, I think it's a great idea, but I'd like to see it happen after I retire. <laughs> <laughs> Those were his words, right? You sort of like, where's, where's, what's keeping me from leaping across the table and grabbing his throat? <laughs> and that, that's almost actually what happened. Um, and then his boss, Hickman, he basically... He said, well, I'm not going to do what my exploration manager doesn't want to do. I don't know about this technology shit. That's, that's out of my domain. And then Hick, or Hickman's boss, Jerry, Jerry Ellis, he was like, well, he was kind of new to it, and he didn't really want to go around his people. But the dynamic was there was a guy equivalent to Jerry Ellis sitting in corporate, strategic <coughs> officer, a guy named Jim Lewis. Jim had a bag of money, and he ran BHP research, and he did not like Jerry. So we went to him, and he gave us the money. That pissed all the guys off in minerals, but they accepted it because they had Prescott's mandate, 15% real. Everybody was scared shitless about, we have to keep growing the company. We have to do stuff that it appears we're growing the company. And this definitely had lots of high tech, lots of sex appeal in that regard. So we finally got the money. Um, it was an interesting exercise going around uh, basically your entire chain of command and they nobody ever just said you're gonna die there was a, actually a lot the, the la the you know there's different ways of showing that you're sort of on a, a small piece of ice that's getting smaller and everybody else is kind of waving at you <laughs> and I kind of felt that in the latter part of the decade and that's that was okay but we carried on we identified and, uh, and contracted uh, Sandra Geophysics to do all the, the original uh, trialing work. Um, so they provided aircraft services and no their knowledge and expertise. This is one of their airplanes at the hangar in Buffalo, probably 97-ish range. I think that's when we started the actual flying. We had discussions, a lot of discussions beforehand. But, uh, and our test case, I mean, gravity's great. There were cliffs nearby east of the airport. That's all you need, just places where there's no mass. So we didn't need any sophisticated ore body. We actually went down to Heath Steel uh, as a trial, but we did a lot of the initial uh, 
fact, at a meeting in 98, that's what I showed the, the exploration team. It was basically uh, the re results of that. So, telescope forward a few years. Uh, I've left, trying to start Condor. This is May 2002. This is a note from the then managing director. Prescott's gone. They didn't drop the project. But they had found the Holy Grail. The Holy Grail had arrived. Oops. What did I do? That's cool. Anyways, that's a... Got you as well. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Um, so this, uh, because I was no longer with the company, I had to look over the fence like everybody else as to what they'd done. And they did publish enough information to kind of get a feel for how it went. And this is kind of a synopsis that was uh, put out by Tom Whiting, who went on from being exploration manager in Australia to... Um, general exploration manager, and now he's he's retired. But this is what BHP thought they could do with the variety of systems. There was actually, and I won't touch it this time. They had these Galileo, Einstein, Newton, and Fenneman. And you see, this one's in a helicopter. This is what they called the digital system, I believe, and it's lighter, so you could go lower and slower. These were in the uh, Grand Caravans. And of course, you can fly it in bigger planes, as Bell does with their with their version of the Lockheed technology. But you know, that's you can't get a much cheaper platform than that. So they flew up at uh, well after they gave it away, they flew up at Oil Togoi. Lots of work in Australia. We'll see the commodity types. Oh, there it is over here. It's diamonds. Um, it's the top one with pink. Some with iron ore. Not a huge amount. Copper. Lead zinc is the silver. Oil and gas was a frustrating one. We had, a, we had an oil division that, uh, had they been operating in the 18th century, they would have been comfortable, I think. <laughs> we went to them and said, we will give you, or Dubai, or we, what, just tell us. What we want is your moral support, your, your commercial support, that this, is, this could be useful inside the oil industry. They, uh, no, we, just, we don't, what do we do with it? Well, what's Shell doing with airborne gravity? And what's Exxon doing? What, what are all these companies that are your competitors doing with gravity that use? Oh, we use satellite gravity. It's really good. You should try it. And it was like, man, we, could, we couldn't even freaking give it away to these guys. So we just ended that discussion, and I think we finally, the BHP, nobody really liked the guys in the oil group anyway. So it was, like, it was easy not to like them, right? They just, one, of them, one of them got, got his ass fired. He was... Uh, he made, uh, he was a real, they call him a, ga a gas petrohead or whatever. But when the Formula One was running in Melbourne, he had a, you know, box seat and stuff like this. And he was the only guy in the company who got to smoke in his office because he had a ventilator installed. He was the head of the petroleum group. And then he made some off-the-cuff remark about Prescott. And that got him thrown out the window. But anyways, the geoscientists working for them, God love them, they had no interest. So very little work. Very little work was ever done with the, uh, with the oil and gas group. I think there's a fair bit of uptake with the technology with other for energy uh, now. Um, and certainly, I mean, the, the Sander people have a very effective airborne gravity technology. It's not the same as a gradiometer, but it provides good information. Yet yeah, we're getting close. There's the commodity spread a little bit. And one of the things that BHP fairly quickly had to do. We did all of our own work in the 90s in-house for ourselves. They came out and said, hey, let's get somebody else to pay for it. And then if something's found, we get the benefit of that. So they got themselves into a situation where exploration was being done at arm's length. So I think some of the excitement, some of the passion, and some of the results you would get if you do it yourself are lost. Because your contractors, your guys in suits, that basically say, right, the airplane's going to show up on this day in this airport, we're going to get the data, we're, these guys are going to process it. You know, they became managers of process as opposed to doers of process. So they did a lot of flying um, for a various number of commodities around the world. This was kind of the spread. This was the statistic. They said we said $45 million in flying. The original project was $30 million Australian to build the uh, first two systems. 15 million in follow-up, and that's kind of just the pie, the pie chart. They tried very hard in the Kimberlite side of things, which they actually did because of a caddy, but nothing ever significant came out. 
So, operated from 99 to 2005 exclusively for BHP and its partners. It's attributed with helping directly with the discovery of the Santo Domingo IOCG deposit in Chile. And it's given a, uh, I think we call a strong assist for the Katumba project in uh, um, Zambia. And it's currently being operated, uh, the Falcon technology anyways, by CGG Multiphysics. Then Bell, Geospace, Arkex used to be there, but they're gone. But somebody else has taken. There's the original, original gravity gradiometer system that the Navy built that several other companies fly, but the Falcon system is, is ex was exclusive to BHP and now is exclusive to CGG. There's some of the anomalies. That's MAG on the right, gravity on the left. And we've talked to the BHP people involved, and it's, it's bona fide, even though the discovery was made after BHP exited the project. Very embarrassing. The one in, in, uh, in Zambia, Katumba's sitting down in there, helped with the structural mapping. Not a big honking anomaly like, a, like Santo Domingo. So with that last slide, it all worked. Better than we actually thought it would. By and large, our processing was great. We had stuff five. You know, they say if you've got something two or three years ahead of everybody else, you're doing really well. If it's five or ten years, it's science fiction, right? Because people haven't even thought of the question, let alone what the answer is. Quite often, we were we were addressing questions that nobody else knew existed because we had looked at mineral systems in a different way, and we we fundamentally had visions about what technologies were necessary to pull those things apart. Did we not have enough time? What was our hubris? Ego. We had $100 million to spend. We had lots of money. Um, we did have some of the classic problems, though, that people ended up like... Everybody had to have geotem when geotem was their flavor of the month, even if it wasn't appropriate. So you had a lot of people doing flying and application of technologies that they thought that was a quick trick for getting budget money because management liked it. And so, you know, we had we had copycats within the organization that, that at the end didn't really help the cause. We probably should have we had things like we spent a huge amount of time looking for VMS and then BHP says, no, no, VMS. Who wants a VMS deposit? You know? So we, we had invested huge amounts of flying in, in a, a, a Canada and the northwestern or northeastern US and then just dropped the whole thing with very little follow-up. Um, so it, it ended up being that we, the group changed, we probably needed more time, uh, maybe a smaller, you know, having one of the technologies rather than having all of them kind of like, oh, going at the same time. Um, I don't really know, but I think there is a component of, you should not be blaming the technologies for the lack of discovery success, it's how we use them. In our example here, for the examples that we put out into the marketplace, they're all still there, or I mean, we're better than they were when we developed them, and yet we're still not really getting the rock in the box. So if people tell you, well, we need more power, and we need more channels, and we need more components, and by the way, we should be doing this, any technological solution to me is a double-edged sword. If it's a tactical problem, if you've got something that you, you know, say, I can really, if you do this, I can fix a problem that I have with a mining operation or, you know, rock fracturing or something, that's okay. But in, in a strategic sense, you have to get back to the, the people and the ideas. And then I think the technologies are basically out there. You can pick and choose what you want. Because all this stuff is available commercially now. You don't have to, you know, give up your firstborn to get access to gravity gradiometry. You never should have. They should have made it free for Pete's sake. <laughs> Seriously, they should, have, they should have offered it to the world and said, where do you think? It's like a crowdsourcing thing. We will fly five surveys for nothing. You come up with a, or a good reason why there's likely a deposit there, and we'll put the money in. We'll do the flying. We'll process the data. We'll even drill some holes. But no. So, anyways, that's it. You're off the hook. <laughs>